Welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. I'm Mike Friedman, the 113th president of the National Press Club. I'm the former general manager of CBS Radio Network, now journalist in residence at University of Maryland Global Campus, and executive producer of the Kalb Report public broadcasting series moderated by legendary journalist Marvin Kalb. We thank you for joining us today for our virtual headliner event with journalist Leslie M. M. Bloom, author of Fallout, the Hiroshima cover-up and the reporter who revealed it to the world. Seventy-five years ago, on August 6, 1945, the Enola Gay, a B-29 bomber, took off from Tinian, a 40-square-mile island in the Pacific Ocean's northern Mariana Island chain. A little more than six hours later, at 8.15 a.m. in Japan, the Enola Gay unleashed a bomb nicknamed Little Boy, 141 pounds of uranium-235. The Enola Gay was 11 and a half miles away when it felt the shock waves. President Harry Truman, aboard the USS Augusta, broadcast a three-minute statement announcing America's first use of an atomic bomb and warned Japan that if it did not surrender, the U.S. would unleash, Truman said, a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. And with that, the United States ushered in the atomic age. But what did Americans truly know about Little Boy and its companion, Fat Man, that would soon destroy Nagasaki? Very little, as Ms. Bloom describes in Fallout. After the Japanese surrendered unconditionally, ending World War II, occupation forces closed Hiroshima and Nagasaki to Allied reporters. It wasn't until more than a year later, on August 31, 1946, that the New Yorker magazine published a 30,000-word account of the devastation wrought on Hiroshima. The article, which nearly filled the entire issue of the magazine, was written by a brilliant young writer named John Hersey, who managed to get into the city. Ms. Bloom, a New York Times best-selling author and a Los Angeles-based journalist whose work has appeared in Vanity Fair, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and many other publications, will share with us today more about how John Hersey got the story that opened the world's eyes to the horrifying power of the atomic bomb and how that story has left a lasting imprint on our consciousness. Our headliner joins us remotely today, and our event is being live streamed to protect everyone from COVID-19. The National Press Club is committed to delivering headliner events as safely as possible. We will accept questions from our viewers and listeners. I'll ask as many questions as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. And now, Leslie Bloom, our virtual National Press Club podium is yours. Mike, thank you so much for, for having me and for to all of the team of the National Press Club for inviting me to give this presentation, especially on such a somber, important anniversary. Um, and I, I really wanted an event with the National Press Club as fallout is my rallying cry on behalf of our free press at a time when it is under unprecedented assault. And also I wanted to protect, present my work to a community that has shaped my life and my worldview really since I was a kid. Fallout documents how the U.S. government and occupation forces downplayed, spun, and covered up the true atomic aftermath in Hiroshima and Nagasaki and how one reporter, John Hersey, of the New Yorker magazine was able to get the true story and reveal it to the world. It may seem ironic that the New Yorker was the media outlet to break the greatest investigative story of the war. I mean, after all, the magazine was founded as a sophisticated niche humor magazine in the 1920s, and it was deemed too inessential during World War II to merit a higher uh, paper quota, um, even though it had dispatched correspondence all over the world. Um, unlike the New Yorker, practically every major news operation had um, a bureau or a presence in Japan since day one of the occupation. And therefore, they had squandered their own opportunities to get into Hiroshima and Nagasaki and report on the human toll there, as well as the truth on the U.S.'s experimental new mega weapons, namely that they were the weapons that continued to, to kill long after detonation. So today in this presentation, I'll give the broad strokes of the story behind Hersey's New Yorker article titled simply Hiroshima, which is still considered, still widely considered uh, the most influential work of written investigative journalism ever created, and which has played its own role in ensuring that nuclear weapons have not been used again in warfare since 1945. Um, 
where I've differed from my predecessor scholars on this subject is that I've always approached the subject as a journalist covering another journalist. And my main question going into the project was how Hersey managed to get the scoop of the century. Um, but this really came down to a more specific logistical question. And that was, you know, just how on earth did Hersey get into Japan and Hiroshima in the first place? And starting in August 1945, post bomb occupation forces uh, and, you know, all reporters, uh, uh, sorry. Post uh, Hiroshima had been designated a restricted topic for uh, media by occupation reporters and the same for any reporting pertaining to nuclear matters in general by the US government, even though wartime censorship had ended officially in the autumn of 1945. And so by the time Hersey gets into Japan in the May of, uh, May of 1946, the country is essentially in total lockdown by General MacArthur's forces. The story of Hersey's feet has always emphasized his story's great success, but it has ignored the logistical details. Whereas for me, they were essential to, to the story. One of my first journalism jobs was at ABC News Nightline in the Ted Koppel days, where I began as a production coordinator. And the idea was that you would learn how the logistics are make or break when it comes to getting that kind of story, You know, especially in conflict zones. The coordination of the travel, the hoop leaping of brokering official access, getting embed assignments, the staggering challenges of quote going unilateral as they called it during the 2003 Gulf conflict, i.e. going into a conflict zone independently instead of going in as an embed. And as one of my former Nightline bosses told me then, whoever controls the ground controls the story. So I went into my fallout research determined to reconstruct Hersey's story. Um, and his, his entry into the country and how he operated on the ground when he was there, and then how he managed to evade censors. Um, and there were some especially big uh, surprises on the latter topic. Percy had gone into Japan knowing uh, that the story he wanted to tell was going to reveal that the U.S. was covering up its handiwork in the atomic cities, even though it seemed initially that the U.S. government appeared to be almost ecstatically reporting uh, and ecstatically forthright, uh, really, about its new weapon. And so therefore, the story of the atomic bombing in, uh, in Hiroshima has the strange distinction of being one of the most covered stories in history and also one of the most covered up. Uh, when U.S. President Harry S. Truman, first, uh, uh, first slide, we already have that up, announced uh, the world's first atomic bomb had just been dropped on Hiroshima, he pledged that if the Japanese did not surrender, they would expect a reign of ruin from the air, of, of which, of the like of which had never been seen on this earth. And um, as Mike said, the bomb was you know, a nearly 10,000-pound uranium bomb, dubbed Little Boy, and it packed an explosive payload equivalent to more than 20,000 tons of TNT, the president revealed, and was by far the largest bomb ever used in, in the history of warfare. And reporters and editors, given text of this presidential announcement in advance, received this news in, in disbelief. The White House press corps had been summoned for sort of a precursor announcement by the press secretary. And at first, quote, the news didn't penetrate with most of them required, and, uh, end quote, recalled one wire reporter later. And then when, when reporters scrambled out of the briefing room and called their editors uh, to deliver this news, the editors were also in a state of disbelief. And this, and that, this led to some initial errors in reporting. So for example, next slide, please. Young uh, Walter Cronkite, then a United Press reporter based in Brussels, received a bulletin from Paris about the bomb. And staring at that 20,000 tons of TNT statistic, he thought, quote, clearly those French operators had made a, a mistake, he later stated. So, quote, I changed the figure to 20 tons before sending the story along, um, end quote. And soon as you know, more details of the story came in, he realized that his mistake, uh, he, he said, quote, my mistake became abun abundantly clear. So the press coverage in the immediate aftermath of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki three days later was, was frenzied. I mean, images of mushroom clouds and landscape devastation released by the US military ran on front pages around the world. But at this point, no foreign press was yet on the ground in Japan, and they were largely relying on military-issued information. And despite the crush of early coverage of the bombings, there was little reporting on the human toll beneath those mushroom clouds. Next slide, please and the true aftermath of the US government's efforts, I'm sorry, uh, of the true aftermath of the then experimental weapons, uh, thanks to the immediate government efforts to control information about their handiwork in Japan. The United States, 
which had just won a painfully earned moral and military victory over Axis powers, had already been concerned that it might, quote, get the reputation for outdoing Hitler in atrocities, end quote, as the country's former Secretary of War had put it after the firebombing of Tokyo earlier that year and the outside, outsized death tolls there. Right away, officials in Washington, D.C. and newly arriving occupation forces in Japan went into overdrive to contain the story of the human cost of their new weapon. Before Allied troops came ashore, the Japanese media had begun reporting widely on the aftermath in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and disturbing reports began to filter over to the United States about a sinister post-bomb affliction killing off blast survivors in the most agonizing manner. At, uh, at this point, it was still occasionally even reported that the bomb might have given off some kind of gas that was sickening people. I mean, that was the pre-atomic way of, of thinking because World War I had seen the use of weaponized poison gas. And as it has been said, World War I was the chemist's war, while World War II would prove to be the physicist's war. For the incoming occupation leadership, the timing of these early reports could not have been worse. U.S. forces were converging upon the Japanese islands, preparing to move tens of thousands of occupation troops into the country, including into Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then uh, the, the world's first Hiroshima dispatch in a Western media outlet broke, uh, worrying leadership even more. Former United Press uh, journalist Leslie Nakashima, who before the war had possessed both American and Japanese citizenship and had been stranded in Tokyo and, and Japan for the duration of, of the conflict, had gotten into Hiroshima on August 22nd. And then five days later, uh, UP ran his eyewitness account of what he had seen in the city. The city of 300,000 had vanished, Nakashima reported. Not a single building had been left standing intact in the city. Hiroshima was a horrific landscape of rubble and ash. And Nakashima also reported that Little Boy had not finished its handiwork on August 6th. Blast survivors, quote, continue to die daily from burns suffered from the bomb's ultraviolet rays, end quote, he reported adding that the majority of the cases at surviving hospitals, quote, are held to be hopeless, end quote. As occupation troops arrived at the end of August, they worked quickly to put an end to such reports, but not with total success at first. Next slide, please. Australian war reporter Wilfred Burchett, correspondent for London's Daily Express, managed to get away from the troops that he had arrived with, make his way into Hiroshima, and fire a, file a horrifying report, which ran under the all-caps headline, The Atomic Plague. This was his warning to the world, he wrote, confer and he confirmed Nakashima's report of the total devastation and also that a, quote, sinister disease X, end quote, was painfully killing blast survivors. When he eventually returned to Tokyo sick and exhausted, he arrived while U.S. officials were in the process of giving a press conference, denying rumors that radiation was killing off uh, blast survivors. Burchett dramatically materialized at the conference, unshaven and dirty, and confronted the officials about what he had seen. Quote, you fall into Japanese propaganda, he was told, end quote. Burchett was subsequently hospitalized, and while he was there, his camera film containing images of Hiroshima mysteriously disappeared. And probably unsurprisingly, he also learned that his press accreditation, accreditation had been revoked. Burchett's report had been obviously quite displeasing to the U.S., but occupation officials had at least been able to intercept what would have been another equally devastating report out of Nagasaki, which American reporter George Weller of the Chicago Daily News, next slide please, was attempting to file, and Weller had zero respect for General MacArthur's censors. Quote, I had a right to be in Nagasaki closed or not, Weller stated later. I was not going to be stifled, end quote. After all, Americans have been fighting this just concluded war for the survival of democracy, of which a free press was a, an essential pillar. And Americans had therefore been, been partly, according to Will Weller, in fighting to be informed. And what's more, he contended, what the US needed badly was, quote, a long cold bath of reality, end quote. And he meant not just its government, but its citizens as well. However, his 10,000 word report on equal horrors he had witnessed in post-bomb Nagasaki was successfully intercepted and lost. And Weller was effectively stifled. Occupation forces quickly corralled the remaining press. And by then there were hundreds of uh, foreign, uh, foreign correspondents in Japan on hand to cover the September 2nd uh, uh, sur surrender ceremony. Um, they were all corralled into what Wilford Burchett would call a press ghetto in Yokohama, uh, a port city near Tokyo, and a point of entry for occupying troops. And from then on, SCAP, which is uh, 
the acronym for General MacArthur's apparatus, had strict control over which reporters could enter the country and whether they could travel around it. Um, eventually, reporters were able to come from Yokohama to Tokyo, but their leashes were short. And occupation forces kept tabs on reporters, their political dispositions, what they were writing, even their health. SCAP largely controlled the transportation and food. So, you know, if you as a reporter had any intention of traveling around the country or even eating, you were you were under thumb. Um, as one occupation reporter put it, the army kept a, a tight grip on all living under it. Everyone was told how much to eat, how much gasoline to use, how many cigarettes to smoke. Reporters filed reports home uh, from a public relations building, formerly the HQ of Radio Tokyo, under the beady eyes of MacArthur's PR officers. And General MacArthur's head of PR, who was General Legrand Diller, next slide, please was known to correspondents as Killer Diller, and uh, at one point ensured that reporters trying to cover a meeting between uh, Japanese Emperor Hirohito and General MacArthur were met with bayonets. That was must have been fantastic. Um, next slide, please. His eventual replacement, um, Brigadier General Frayne Baker, proved to be only marginally less hostile. And at one point, he told Tokyo-based foreign reporters that they could be court-martialed for publishing classified material under the Articles of War because the United States and Japan technically were still at war. And then he informed them that SCAP's officers could declare any information uh, classified that it liked. And as for the Japanese media, SCAP um, also quickly enacted a strict press code corralling them too. They weren't even allowed to mention Hiroshima and poetry, much less a press report, lest they, quote, disturb the public tranquility, end quote. So meanwhile, the US government had an inside job reporter helping them to downplay the effects of the bomb. The New York Times' uh, William, quote, atomic Bill Lawrence, as he began to be, as he became known. Next slide, please. An old guard science reporter, well-versed in atomic matters, had been secretly hired away from the Times personally by the head of the Manhattan Project, Leslie Groves, that previous spring. Atomic Bill was henceforth to function as sort of an in-house historian of the evolution of the bomb and also to create PR materials, including fake obits of the Manhattan Project principles in case the bomb testing went horribly wrong and wiped them all out. And once General Groves and the other reporters began um, a PR campaign to deny the early radiation, uh, deny the early reports that Japanese blast survivors were dying of radiation, Atomic Bill played a role in, pre in presenting that narrative to the American public. General Groves, next slide, please. Carded Atomic Bill and a junket of other reporters to New the New Mexico testing site. The desert sand around the epicenter of that blast had been transformed into green glass and radioactivity indeed lingered there due to the low height of detonation. Yet Atomic Bill duly reported that the area was completely safe and that Japanese reports of radiation induced death in that country were quote, Tokyo tales. Next slide, please. Groves continued the downplay and deny radio uh, radioactivity PR campaign uh, throughout the fall. And even when he did concede in front of a congressional committee that some in Japan may have been dying from radioactivity and that he said that radioactive radiation poisoning was in actually, quote, a very pleasant way to die, end quote. Meanwhile, with the news of Hiroshima and Nagasaki successfully suppressed, the atomic cities moved off front pages and with surprising rapidity as well, became old stories. The US was prevailing in its campaign and therefore, it was maintaining its moral high ground. That said, the government did want to give its bombs some publicity. I mean, after all, the US was currently enjoying a nuclear monopoly and wanted to remind its allies, enemies, and frenemies of its dominance. Having the bomb gave the US enormous sort of hand of God power, and that was lost on no one, especially the Soviets, who were now at a great disadvantage. And to that end, General Groves estimated that it would have taken anywhere from five to 20 years for the Soviets to develop a bomb of their own. Surprise, it would take four. The US did allow photographs of Hiroshima and Nagasaki's mushroom clouds, next slide please, to be published. With, along with aerial shots of the extensive landscape devastation, just to remind everyone of how powerful the new weapons were. But again, what was missing from those photos, of course, images of the human victims. And support for the US bomb, for in the US for the bombings remained high. And there was, as one contemporary put it, a 4th of July attitude about the bombings. And in a survey taken in August of 1945, nearly a quarter of those Americans 
surveyed stated that they wished that the U.S. had been able to use many more bombs on Japan before that country had surrendered. In August of 1945, back in the States, reporter John Hersey, next slide please, was at something of a crossroads. He was already at a very accomplished, he was already very accomplished at the tender age of 21, having won the Pulitzer for his 1944 war novel, The Bell for Adano. He was also a commended war hero and a veteran war correspondent for Time Magazine, having covered several theaters of war and also founding the Moscow Bureau. And in fact, Henry Luce um, had been grooming him for an event, a possible eventual managing, managing, managing editor position of Time Inc. But uh, Hersey had quit after quarreling with his boss's propagandistic, with his boss over his boss's propagandistic attitude towards the Soviets. So instead of being the heir apparent to a media empire, Hersey was getting used to life as a freelancer and he was planning his next steps during that time. He was in New York when the Hiroshima bombing was announced and had had conflicted feelings about the attack. On the one hand, he was in despair over the scale of death and he felt fear over the world's future. But on the other hand, he did feel that the bombing would likely speed the end of the war. But then when the US bombed uh, Nagasaki three days later, Hersey was horrified. It was, in his opinion, a totally criminal action, his words. He felt that the US had not given Japan sufficient time to respond before killing tens of thousands of more people, again, mostly civilians. He knew right away that he was going to have to write about the bombings. He just didn't know yet in, one, in what capacity. And then in the late fall of 1945, Hersey had lunch with uh, New Yorker's deputy editor, William Sean, who is one of my favorite protagonists in this story. He was a small in stature, quiet, but he also had a powerful charisma. And he, one of his predominant beliefs was that every human life was sacred. And once Lillian Ross, who was one of his writers and later his mistress, grilled him on his belief. And she, she said to him, you know, oh, even Hitler, even Hitler is sacred. And he would say, even Hitler is. Um, over lunch, Hersey and Sean had discussed Hiroshima and concluded that something was really off about the coverage of the post-bomb city. Given that it had been the site, the site of one of the only two targets of nuclear attack in history, it had disappeared from headlines with sp suspicious rapidity, they felt. And furthermore, they mutually realized what coverage there had been was exclusively landscape and building uh, 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 devastation, focused not at all on the human toll and suffering. Um, to be fair, Hersey conceded uh, the aerial shots. I'm sorry, I forgot to show you the slide, uh, William Sean. Next slide, please. There he is. Um, and now next slide again, thank you. The aerial shots of the landscape devastation had been breathtaking, especially when one considered that it had been wrought by one single primitive bomb. But Hersey also felt that rubble was impersonal. In any way, the world was essentially numb to imagery of bombed buildings after more than half a decade of seeing pictures of demolished cities around the globe. It's unclear whether Hersey and Sean knew the extent of the restrictions that had been imposed on Tokyo-based reporters, but they likely had some idea. The journalism community at that point was very close-knit, and many of Hersey's wartime friends and colleagues had been posted to Japan to cover the occupation, and he would have had some sense, at least, of the restrictions. And the two men decided that Hersey would try to get into Japan and write about what had happened, quote, not to the buildings, but to the human beings, end quote, as Hersey would put it. If heavyweight media operations either could not or would not undertake this story, the New Yorker would try. For this team, it was time to learn and reveal the reality of the bombs that had been detonated in the name of country, democracy, and decency itself. So when I first came to this topic, I had thought that Hersey had likely gotten into Japan unilaterally, reported his story, and gotten out again undetected by General MacArthur's uh, forces. Next slide, please. I mean, after all, you know, the, the story of Hersey's success of Hiroshima has been told, but again, there's never been any attempt to figure out how he'd gotten it. And only when I really started researching General MacArthur's domination of Japan did I realize how impossible it would have been for any journalist eight months into the occupation to try to get access to the country solo. Even the first in reporters, including Wilford Burchett and George Weller, who were combative as hell with MacArthur's press people, had had to accompany allied military forces into the country as accredited war correspondents. 
uh, by the time Hersier was trying to access Japan months later, SCAF wielded near total control over who could enter Japan. You had to be vetted and cleared for uh, vetted and cleared for entrance, and then vetted and cleared to travel around the country. And even if you were cleared to travel, you were given a limited amount of time in each destination. So Hersey was not going to be able to sneak in. He would have to apply for clearance. However, he had advantages that the more combative reporters like Weller did not. And as I say in Fallout, Hersey was a perfect Trojan horse candidate to be admitted to the country. His own wartime record would have made him seem to scap, you know, relatively innocuous. He had played by the rules throughout the war, but as an accredited war correspondent, he had written glowing wartime profiles of the members of the military, including quite a laudatory wartime biography of General MacArthur. May we have the next slide, please? And this was written with the help and approval of the War Department. So this, of course, helped immeasurably in terms of his chances of getting into to occupied Japan. Hersey began his reporting trip in China. Next slide, please. And he applied there for clearance to Tokyo. His wartime cooperation must have indeed worked in his favor because uh, uh, clearance was, was granted along even with military transport into Japan. However, just because he had been granted um, entry did not mean that he was granted free reign. Not only was SCAP monitoring him as they closely monitored everybody in the occupation press corps, Tokyo-based FBI operatives and, FBI in D and the FBI in DC were appraised of his arrival. He was going to have to tread carefully. Now, it may seem miraculous when I tell you that he was also given permission to travel briefly to Hiroshima for a limited time as well. Access to the atomic cities was still restricted and Hiroshima and Nagasaki were still restricted topics. But a few, a few factors helped Hersey get access. First of all, his timing was good. The US government and occupation forces now felt that it had resolutely contained the aftermath story for so many months that Hiroshima was increasingly seen as, quote, yesterday's news. The public had moved on and just as important, the press had moved on. And even if reporters had chafed about being restricted over Hiroshima and Nagasaki that previous fall, now there were new scoops to buy for, new developments to cover. For example, there were war crimes trials going on in Tokyo. When Hersey applied to SCAP GHQ to, for clearance to travel to Hiroshima, there may have been some bemusement about why a reporter of his stature was asking to visit the site of such a quote old story, especially when you know his lesser known colleagues had all been given up on it, had all been given up on it. Um, and occupation forces had been allowing some journalists into Hiroshima in recent months, but mostly to report carefully vetted stories on how that city was staging a comeback. So there were indeed, you know, again earlier that spring, some more nothing to see here stories, including one in the New York Times. Next slide, please that ran on Hiroshima, noting that much of the population had returned and uh, were planting gardens and the ruins and so on. So it's not entirely surprising that Hersey was being allowed a glimpse in. Occupation officials who greenlighted this passage would soon regret this decision. And Hersey, but to this end also still, Hersey and uh, William Sean also decided that it would be best if Hersey quietly collected his reporting under these circumstances and then hightail it back to the US to write the story away from General MacArthur's censors. When he did arrive in Hiroshima, Hersey was appalled and terrified by the devastation there. Next slide, please even so many months later. And let's not forget that Hersey was a seasoned war correspondent. He had seen, seen it all in theaters uh, throughout the war from combat to concentration camps. And he had been stunned that all of this destruction had been wrought by a single primitive bond. And all that chirpy reporting that Hiroshima was making a comeback, well, Hersey found a starving, impoverished population that was essentially living in metal shanties in the ruins. And as for those gardens, some of the flora that was indeed staging a comeback had apt names like feverfew and panic grass. He vowed to work as quickly as he could. He made inroads um, and found several dozen blast survivors who were willing to speak with him with the help of resident Japanese priest, next slide please, um, who spoke Japanese and English and a Japanese pastor, next slide please, who had been educated in the US each of the testimonies that Hersey heard were uniquely horrifying. Hersey had decided he would tell the story of six of them, again, regular folks whose paths had overlapped on that horrible day. And this may seem like an obvious approach now, but then it was revolutionary. 
much of the, the story of the bomb had been told in terms of the end of days might, not from an individual's point of view. And as Hersey realized, not everybody could comprehend the physics of how the bomb worked or envi envision you know, an all out global war. But any reader could empathize with the story of a mother, a father, a, you know, a young clerk, a, a doctor going to work you know, early one morning, feeding their family one morning when catastrophe strikes. Percy's idea was that he wanted American readers to experience the disaster through the eyes of these six humans, because for him, it was imperative that he bring out the human aspect of the bombing and wrestle the story back from clinical casualty statistics. Americans and the rest of the world still had yet to comprehend and face what had happened there. And this was a possible way for them to do so. And Hersey quickly found his protagonists, a young widow, next slide please, with three young children, a young female clerk, next slide please, a young Japanese medic, next slide please, and a Japanese doctor with his own small hospital, next slide please along with the German priest and Japanese pastor who were helping him translate and make inroads among the survivors. He had not been given much time on the ground in Hiroshima by occupation authorities, just about 14 days, including travel. And as he was leaving Hiroshima, he thought about one of his protagonists, a Mrs. Saki, the young clerk. When a bomb had gone off, bookshelves had collapsed on top of her, mutilating one of her legs and uh, nearly crushing her to death. And he thought about how ironic it was to be nearly felled by books in the first moments of the atomic age. And he knew he would be putting a line to that effect in his report. Eventually he began his long trip back to the US. Hersey did write Hiroshima as his article was eventually titled back in New York City. And it was edited in extreme secrecy in, New in with New Yorker editors, William Sean and Harold Ross. Next uh, slide, please. Sequestered in Ross's locked office. Almost no one else at the magazine was allowed to know what they were working on. Uh, and contributors were even reportedly kept working on a dummy issue. For Hersey and his editors, the Hiroshima writing project was akin to their own Manhattan project. And the pressure on them was absolutely enormous. They knew how huge and contentious the story was. It would confront countless Americans who strongly believed that the US occupied the moral high ground in the, in the atomic bombing. It would also reveal how much the US government had covered up about the bombings and the radio, radioactive after effects of the new bombs. Even depicting Japanese victims in themselves in human terms was going to be controversial after years of widespread wartime depictions of them as animalistic subhumans. Next slide, please. The New Yorker story was nearly done when an awful obstacle arose. President Truman signed the Atomic Energy Act, which had a restricted data provision barring anyone from revealing what the government considered to be proprietary information about atomic weapons. Those deemed in violation of the act faced imprisonment, substantial fines, or worse. It was a nightmare scenario. Hersey and his New Yorker editors now had to make an agonizing decision. They could defang the story or kill it entirely or they could run it as is and risk severe legal penalties, or they could submit the story to the War Department for vetting and censorship. So you guys are gonna hate me for this, but I don't wanna give away what decision that they made because this chapter and information is one of the bigger revelations of the book and also because my publisher would kill me. But let's just say that at this stage, General Leslie Groves, next slide please, himself got involved in the story of how Hersey's story made its way into the world. General Groves appears to have found some cynical utility in Hersey's reporting on the agonies inflicted by the weapon whose creation he had spearheaded. And he also found certain advantages at that moment to having Hersey's article out in the world. As you all know, Hersey's report did indeed run, which ended up being no small miracle, and it did take almost up take up almost the entire contents of the August 31st issue of the New Yorker. Next slide, please. The international public reaction was explosive, which is how Hersey put it, not me. I personally tried very hard not to use that word in my book, but he was right in this characterization. And again, I don't want to give away too much about the fallout of his reporting, but in broad strokes, this is what shook out. Firstly, Hiroshima basically stopped. America in its tracks and it caused an international furor. Readers across the country were transfixed and horrified as they were transported into the experience of August 6 and the awful days that followed. Even though um, even the most assured people were rattled, although there were naysayers too. Now go right up the massacre of Nanking, 
wrote one irate um, reader to the editors of the New Yorker, but for the most part, readers were truly shaken. Number two, the government's cover-up was indeed revealed. Editorials and readers across the country demanded to know what other information had, about the bombs and the bombings had been concealed from them. And the government was put very much on the defensive. The record needed to be set straight, said Pre President Truman privately, although he never publicly commented on Hiroshima beyond stating after a reporter quizzed him on whether he had read Hersey's report, quote, I never read the New Yorker, it just makes me mad. Efforts to put the genie back in the bottle um, via a factually challenged and evasive retort article in Harper's Magazine, ostensibly authored by former Secretary of War Henry Stimson, but in reality co-authored by what by one biographer called the Old Boy War Boy Network, uh, War Department Network. Um, the in the article, Stimson and his co-authors tried to re-seize the narrative by stating that the bomb had saved lives, both American lives and Japanese lives, by shortening over shortening the war and glossed over the agonies in Hersey's story. The face of war is the face of death, said Stimson, but the article never once used the word radiation and did not even attempt to address the cover-up, and nor could it ever erase the now indelible portrait of nuclear war that Hersey had presented to the world. And finally, a less, uh, a less likely part of the narrative how the Soviets reacted to Hersey's Hiroshima. In short, they hated it, they hated him, and they even tried to smear him as an American spy who was trying to sow panic. They even sent their own Pravda journalist to Nagasaki who reported on stories of the bomb's deadliness um, and concluded that they had been greatly exaggerated. So apparently Moscow was not enjoying um, its current, albeit temporary, dis nuclear disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis its former, uh, former ally. It's also worth noting that the press was shown up by Hersey's Hiroshima, Hersey's Hiroshima because he did, after all, implicitly highlight their own failings too. None of the big media operations with all of their resources had gotten the story. The New York Times was shown up perhaps the worst of all. Um, after all, it had run all of the Tokyo Tales coverage by Atomic Bill Lawrence, coverage which ironically had helped to earn him the Pulitzer Prize that year for his overall reporting on the bomb. But for the most part, with a few flagrant exceptions, Editors and reporters were, were gracious and even marveled at Hersey's coup. And that included the New York Times. And even though Hersey, Hersey's story was some 30,000 words long, incredibly long for a, a news magazine story, it was reprinted in publications around the globe and read aloud in its entirety on ABC and the BBC. And at least 500 radio stations covered it in this country alone. As one correspondent said at the time, even if you haven't read it, it's all you're talking about right now. Hersey's Hiroshima remains the most influential work of written investigative journalism ever written, and it regularly tops journalism best of lists. And earlier this year, I was talking to Carl Bernstein, who noted benevolently that Hersey is always above him and Bob Woodward in those best of, best of journalism lists. And despite this, Bernstein has said he has the greatest admiration for Hersey's accomplishment. Quote, this is what he, one of the things he wrote about it to me. The combination of Hersey's meticulous reporting and the power of his understated narrative produced a work of singular importance in the post-war world, awakening humanity to the destructive horror that unleashed the nuclear age. This awakening, Bernstein went on, led to, to the deterrence that detected, detected the, uh, dictated the terms of the Cold War. No story within weeks of its population publication, sorry, sorry, Carl. Um, no story within weeks of its publication had such determinative impact on the history of future generations. And mercifully, that is the end of my presentation. Um, and Mike, I would be very happy to hear any questions. Thank you uh, very much. And I found that very compelling, and it and it begs a question, which I was going to save for the for the end of the interview. I'm just going to move it right up here. So here we are in August of of 2020. We're absorbing as a nation a global pandemic that has already cost 150,000 lives uh, in the U.S. alone. A generational outcry for racial equality and social justice, an assault on truth and journalism by no less than the President of the United States that may well be hampering our ability to move forward in a positive manner to get past the pandemic uh, and face our original sin of slavery um, in this country. And now we're at the 75th anniversary 
of the dropping of the atomic bombs that brought World War II to an end, a war that cost the nation hundreds of thousands of lives in combat and related casualties, and ultimately, of course, as you mentioned, wreaked havoc on two Japanese cities and their citizens for generations. Are there lessons from John Hersey's work and the closeout of World War II and keeping this material secret until John Hersey revealed it in The New Yorker that we can apply now, that we can use today? Well, I mean, two, two things come to mind right away. And first of all, you know, as I said at the beginning of my presentation, this really was my rallying cry on behalf of our free press. And I think, you know, many people have been disgusted, as I have been, and I suspect many people watching today have been, about the uh, unprecedented attacks on our press over the last four and a half years by our president and his supporters. I personally have been you know, just horrified by the designation of uh, our journalists as enemies of the, of the people. I think um, while many Americans have some sense of how crucial a free press is to their well-being and to the survival of our democracy. I don't think that they're, they understand how significant it is and how screwed they be, would be without it. Um, and I think, frankly, we need to find more ways to, to support our press, whether that is by decrying um, you know, the regular attacks against our journalists, whether on social media or in conversations in, within our communities, and also just by literally supporting your local journalism uh, outlets, whether it's your local newspaper, your local stations. Um, I think also what Hersey did um, with Hiroshima in terms of taking the, the narrative from the, the eye of God level down to the human level is an extremely valuable uh, tool for journalists to use today, especially, for instance, when covering a uh, COVID-19 crisis. But in any catastrophe or any atrocity situation, one of the things that is imperative right now is to bring these stories down to the human level and to wrest them away from the realm of clinical casualty statistics and make sure that Americans understand that 155,000 dead, each one of those people, it was a mother, a father, a daughter, a son, a colleague, a neighbor, and to you know really bring out the individual human element of it to drive home how grave the situation is and to hold the powerful to account in the situation. I, I just find Hersey's method, again, it's, it seemed revolutionary then, it seems obvious now, but it really could be employed to great advantage right now. In the book, um, speaking of the headlines of the day that included huge numbers, uh, Louis Gannett of the New York Herald Tribune said, quote, you swallowed statistics, gasped in awe, and turning away uh, to discuss the price of lamb chops forgot. But if you read what Mr. Hersey writes, you won't forget. Um, are we at risk today during the pandemic uh, of becoming desensitized to the statistics? Um, there's certainly evidence of fatigue across the country. Um, you talk about putting a human face on it. Um, uh, do you find that is, uh, is happening um, uh, today? Are there any particular stories that, that come to mind to you that that help ensure that we don't forget the human element of this? Well, I think, look, y yes, the answer is yes. And, and, the, and the, the Lewis Gannett quote was one of the most remarkable that I found. I mean, it really stopped me in my tracks because what it seemed to, to, to say is that, you know, we have a, we may be hardwired when it comes to mathematics like that for indifference. You know, the, he, what he also said is the human mind refuses to react to those mathematics. And it actually, the higher the statistics get, the more unfathomable, it's almost ironically easier to, to see the human element behind them. Um, so yes, absolutely, there is a danger of, of um, again, dismissing or not comprehending the human element of, of the pandemic right now. And I do think, you know, when you when you read, um, you know, newspapers, there are efforts that are being made to profile, you know, a handful of um, casualties, COVID casualties, you know, you know, this uh, COVID obituaries. Um, I think I remember, you know, when 9-11 happened and the New York Times did that massive um, that massive section when they profiled all the 3,000 dead and you know it was just vignettes about each person but each vignette really 
brought that person to life um, in a really specific way. I mean, the challenge of doing that for 155,000 dead would be enormous, but you know, we do need to, in almost a daily way, find, you know, encourage our publications to remind their readers and their viewers that each one of these casualties is a, is a human being. Perhaps Edward R. Murrow's most compelling broadcast aired in 1945, following the liberation of the Buchenwald concentration camp. Uh, among the first journalists allowed into the camp, he returned to his hotel room for three days to compose himself before delivering his report. Mm -hmm. uh, in a deeply emotional line for radio, Murrow said, men were crawling toward the latrine. I saw it, but mm -hmm. will not describe it. For a radio audience, that painted a devastating picture for the mind's eye that he felt words could not adequately convey. You mentioned in the book the published images of Hiroshima's demolished landscape gravely undersold uh, the reality of atomic aftermath. Usually a picture is worth a thousand words, but in this case it would take Hersey's 30,000 words to reveal and drive home the truth about America's new mega weapon. It sounds like the opposite of Murrow's approach, yet mm -hmm. perhaps an absolute necessity in this instance. Yeah, I, I, it's it's ironic. I mean, I suppose it depends on the situation. I mean, in some, in some catastrophes, it will be a single photograph that really drives home the enormity of the situation or the horror of a situation. Um, and so I found it extremely ironic that um, that it was going to take a thirty thousand word article to really paint this this picture for for most Americans. Um, but again, we have to remember that during that period of time, I mean, Americans had just they were in a, in what I call a state of you know atrocity fatigue, and World War II remains the deadliest human conflict in 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 human history. And you know, seeing horrific picture after horrific picture of um, you know rubble devastated cities. I mean, they were, uh, uh, many readers and viewers were just inured to that. Um, and so it was a, a really, this was a really rare instance where a hugely in-depth and an extremely long portrait, and frankly, a, a dispassionate portrait, which is important to, to say, because as Hersey said, if I had screamed my, my rage, you know, from the rooftops, nobody would, would have listened, but he presented his story in a very almost Hemingway clipped, you know, nothing but the facts tone um, that that's what it was going to take to to penetrate the American consciousness. Um, so it, 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 it I'll, I'll be fascinated to see what ends up being the defining work of this particular catastrophe that we're living through right now. This is um, a couple of questions from uh, former National Press Club president and journalist Gil Klein. Um, tell us a little bit about your research um, uh, about what happened in the three-day interval between the first and the second bombings. Uh, we understand that Hersey was infuriated uh, that the second bomb uh, was uh, was dropped. Talk about that. Well, I mean, Hersey was in New York um, when the when the bombs were dropped, and uh, he was listening to a radio uh, report when he heard about Hiroshima, and he was really jarred by the report. And you know, as a you know, said earlier, you know, he had mixed feelings about it on one hand, you know, the, the catastrophic, the probable death toll, because nobody knew yet what it, what, what it was going to be, but they just knew that the devastation was going to be horrific. I mean, he was horrified by that, but, you know, he had also covered um, the Pacific theater. He had covered, uh, you know, combat between the Americans and the Japanese. And he also had reason to believe that the war would have been protracted. He was getting, um, correspondence from friends who had covered Okinawa, who were testifying to the, you know, the, the phrase that was regularly used then was the tenacity of the Japanese. Um, so he felt that as horrible as the bomb, first the Hiroshima bomb was, that it, it likely was going to speed the end of the war. But then um, when he heard news about Nagasaki, he said that he thought that it was, quote, a, a, a totally criminal action. And that there had not been adequate time given to the Japanese to to collect themselves and make their surrender. Um, you know, there's evidence that uh, you know the Japanese at first, you know, right after Hiroshima, um, didn't truly comprehend what was going on on August 8th. 
they dispatched one of their um, leading physicists and who was the head of their own nuclear uh, a bomb project, which was not very advanced, um, went to Hiroshima and then reported back to the government what he had seen. And it was at that moment where he said, you know, I, I hate to tell you this, but it was an atomic bomb. But even up until that point, they didn't have official confirmation that the, the new mega weapon that had been used was indeed an atomic bomb. So there was they were still still reacting, um, you know, during that moment. And in the meantime, the Japanese press by its own government was being suppressed on the enormity of the damage in Hiroshima. So is there, um, this is another question from Gil, um, uh, President Truman offered that three minute broadcast message statement um, from a board ship. Um, do we have a sense of exactly how much Harry Truman knew about this and, and, and about the, the ramifications that it would cause? Well, I mean, they had tested the bomb, you know, successfully on uh, July 16th in New Mexico. I mean, they, 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 look, the bomb was still experimental then. I don't think that they had any, you know, true idea of what the, what the effects were, the long-term effects were going to be in their totality. I mean, there was even the question in the minds of the Manhattan Project principals when they were testing the first bomb, um, would it incinerate the Earth, the Earth's atmosphere? I mean, for them, they thought that was a, was a possibility, but um, it didn't happen. We're all still here. Um, Truman uh, had not been told about the bomb until, uh, you know, until after FDR had died in the spring of 1945. But then was, you know, very involved in being appraised of the, of the project's progress because they did see it as a war-ending proposition. And Leslie Groves of the Manhattan Project had been commissioned to create that bomb, create it fast, and make it ready for wartime use. There was never any question that if the war was still going on, that they would use use the bomb. Um, and then, you know, when uh, Truman got news of the Hiroshima, the successful Hiroshima bombing, I mean, he was absolutely overjoyed. When you read the testimonials of reporters who were traveling with him on the way back from Potsdam, he was just giddy on that ship and uh, literally told one of them, this is the, the, the big, or told the ship's captain, I have to see who the, the exact recipient of this news was. He said, this is the greatest thing ever. Um, so, I mean, they were, he was pretty ecstatic about about the, the successful detonation. One of the, one of the most compelling and controversial Pulitzer Prize winning photographs is that of a sitting vulture watching uh, a famine stricken child in Sudan in 1993. It was taken by photojournalist Kevin Carter uh, who committed suicide four months after winning the Pulitzer Prize in 1994. Um, do you have a sense of what the impact on John Hersey uh, was of, of what he saw and what he heard, and um, did it affect how he conducted himself personally and professionally from that point on? I mean, Hersey was an extremely private person, um, and he didn't, you know, talk. He gave very few interviews, and frankly, piecing together his narrative was extremely challenging for that reason. Although there was more, he left more of a record of himself than I was led to believe you know, that there was before I went into the project. Um, but we can, you know, look at the trajectory of his life and draw certain conclusions. I mean, he, after Hiroshima, he essentially, he did he did some more reporting, but he never did anything on the level of reporting on Hiroshima. Again, he, he became a fiction writer predominantly. Um, I always, to be honest, I found him curiously optimistic about human nature, especially considering that he had seen absolutely the worst of it and in such heavy doses throughout the war and then in, in Hiroshima. Um, you know, he really believed that, you know, uh, uh, you know, obviously we now had invented the most horrific way to end our own civilization, but he also believed in, you know, the tenacity of human spirit. And even though he said, you know, our continued existence as a civilization on this planet is what he called, quote, a big if, he said that he strongly believed that man's desire to stay on the planet was stronger than his ability to his desire to to do away with it. Um, he had four children. Uh, I, I don't know how you bring four children into the world unless you have a, a measure of, of optimism about its future. Um, you know, and look, we're not in very optimistic times at this moment. And you know, I per, I will confess to say that you know I have really tried hard to find the wellspring of his optimism because I, I feel like I could use a dose of it in my own. And, you know, when I'm 
see somebody who, again, who has seen so much of the worst in human nature and still finds reasons to find our, our species redeeming, um, it, it, it helps me a little bit also. We had uh, welcomed last week to the National Press Club the um, wonderful documentary filmmaker, Ken Burns, um, who talking about and, and putting some context and perspective on the pandemic and the other crises that we're enduring uh, right now, uh, initially said that we are living in a hell of our own making, but ultimately said that we still have to turn to our better angels. And, uh, and he cited as a person who gives him inspiration right now, the late John Lewis. And of course, tying everything together, it was John Lewis who said that without the press, the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings. And so mm -hmm. uh, talking about John Hersey's work and your work uh, about John Hersey, it all, uh, it, it all folds together. Um, in, in context, in the moment, um, having been at war since December of 1941, nearly four years, um, mm -hmm. what alternatives might we have had and would they have been worth the risk to American lives had we not dropped the atomic bombs? Could we have, for instance, dropped that first bomb in an unpopulated area to show the Japanese the devastating impact without costing so many lives? Could that have had an impact? Um, your thoughts? Well, I mean, look, when the government, when Henry Stimson and then the old boy war uh, department network went to work on their article that was you know one of the things that they addressed because immediately there had been questions that you know resurfaced about why why didn't we give them a demonstration the demonstration would have been sufficient and uh their rationale was well we could have but if, if it had been a dud it would have been catastrophic um and it would have been totally discrediting um, to us, so we we felt like our only choice was to use it on um, on a populated city. And you know, Hiroshima was one uh, it was one option on a list of several of several cities. Um, you know, Hiroshima was was on that list because allegedly it was it was you know had high military value. Um, it was a a point where troops uh, came and went from. And but it's been now estimated that the city, the number of the, among those killed, the hundred thousand to two hundred eighty thousand killed, only ten percent of those were Japanese military uh, personnel. Um, another uh, reason that the the Stimson team uh, cited for not having used a, a demonstration is they they just they, he said we didn't have enough bombs. I mean it was you know they only had. They were working on Little Boy. They were working on Fat Man, and they didn't feel like they, you know, if a, a demonstration had been a dud, um, they couldn't just keep demonstrating until, until you know, they, they just didn't have infinite supply. They made quite a big, a big uh, deal out of this this strange argument, um, but they, in, in my opinion, inadequately put forward the argument that the demonstration was not an option. There's a quote uh, from the terrific John Ford film, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, in which a newspaper editor tears up um, a true story that has just been revealed many years later uh, after the fact that, uh, that the story was put out in a different way. And he says, when the legend becomes fact, print the legend. Um, has that mantra not served us well in this country? Has that led to our denial of elements of, of our history that perhaps must be rectified in order to carve a path to a better future now? Well, I look, I mean, I think in in the very narrow case of, of this topic that I've reported on, I mean, the legend has been that, um, or the, the mythology, the storytelling, the predominant narrative has been that the U.S. needed to drop the bombs to save lives, mm -hmm. American lives and Japanese lives. And that it was actually, you know, a humane end to the war because not only did it save those lives, it even saved the Japanese civilian population from, you know, uh, um, uh, having had to have their their building their uh, country quarantined off um, ahead of time. And so, 
even though Hersey's reporting came out and it showed the true horrors of nuclear warfare and what's at stake when we attack another country with, with nuclear weapons, um, the predominant belief still, I mean, even, even though there's a widespread acknowledgement that these were horrible and that um, it, it really hampers leaders' ability to just pull the trigger on using another one with, with great ease, the legend and the predominant narrative remains that the bombs were, were necessary. Um, and 75 years later, now that there are fewer people who have a personal emotional connection to it, you know, historians and journalists really are coming back and hammering at that narrative over and over again. And I think that anytime you have a legend, anytime you have a predominant narrative, it needs to be relentlessly examined um, and new information will come up and we have to work very hard to uncover information and just make sure, you know, kick the kick the wheels of the the narrative and see if they see if it holds weight and we're living with that on a lot of fronts um today last question for you um what what are your takeaways from having written the book and what would you like the takeaways to be for journalists who uh who read this book well first of all i have to say that i'm already racked with terror that I'm never going to find another topic that is meant to me it meant as much to, that will mean as much to me as this book has meant to me. I can't tell you how righteous and incredible it has felt to work on this book for the last four years, especially considering our current landscape. And you know again, this is my rallying cry on behalf of our press and when it's under unprecedented assault, I hope that journalists find courage in it and uh, find courage in Hersey's example and remember how deadly important their work is. Um, and if this is, you know, my contribution to contributing to morale of journalists during a very, very difficult time when they've never been more needed, then that that's uh, as big a contribution as I could possibly make. If anybody's wondering right now whether they should uh, go out and get the book, I would encourage them to read the New York Times review of your book, and that should push them over the top. Um, that, was, uh, that was an awfully good review. Um, Thank you. That, that will be the final word. Um, our thanks to Leslie M.M. M. Bloom, author of Fallout, the Hiroshima cover-up, and the reporter who revealed it to the world. Uh, Leslie, we're very pleased to present you with our um, uh, coveted National Press Club coffee mug, along with a sincere hope that you can join us in person uh, in, in the very near future. And this will be coming your way. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Our thanks to the organizers of today's event, headliners, co-team leaders, Donna Line Juan Loger and Lori Russo, our producer, Lindsay Underwood, and our terrific National Press Club team behind the scenes here in the Broadcast Operations Center. We thank our members and guests for your good questions and for joining us. Be well, stay safe, and have a good day.